Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Animaction. Welcome to another episode of The Doctor's Deep Dives, where I choose one particular animated series to take a nice, thorough look at. Today I'll be doing that for the tragically short-lived 1988 series Dino Riders. Keep watching for an upcoming alternating video covering Tokusatsu in America, which will come out... sometime. Hopefully sooner than later. Don't forget to come join the conversation on Discord and check out the channel memberships. Don't hesitate to let me know if you have an idea for something you'd like to see them include as well, because, well, I'm kind of new to them. But that's it for the housekeeping. Time to jump in. And so, the battle continues in a new place in time with Dino Riders. Dino Riders follows two warring factions, the peace-loving Valorians and the warmongering Rulons, as a group of our heroes flee the invasion of their planet, Valoria. Led by the steadfast Questar, the Valorians use their space-time energy projector, or STEP for short, in an attempt to facilitate their escape. But the Rulons, aboard their flagship the Dreadlock, have the escapees locked in a tractor beam. The two technologies interact in an unexpected way, and the Valorian ship is flung through time and space, finding themselves on the Earth 65 million years in the past. Unbeknownst to them, though, the Rulons were pulled along the same path, meaning that the war followed them as well. The Rulons, at the direction of the warlord Krulos, begin to weaponize dinosaurs near their landing site, turning them into mindless armored war machines bristling with weapons. With no other options available, the Valorians use their amplified mental projectors to form symbiotic relationships with and befriend their nearest dinos, likewise equipping them to defend themselves in their new world from the Rulons' evil plans. Though I don't like the label personally, there's no doubt that Dino Riders was released in support of the Tyco toy line of the same name that released around the same time in 1988. The initial line consisted of 12 playsets, 6 for each faction, consisting of a dino, one or more riders, and the various weapons and armor to outfit them with. However, Tyco didn't just slap some lasers on dinosaurs and randomly crank out a few fantastical sounding character names. The line was conceived from the very start with a rich backstory drafted by the company's head of research and development, Warren Bosch. His original draft proposal underwent several modifications throughout the development process, during which time illustrator Paul Kirchner, veteran of the science fiction magazine Heavy Metal and various toy-related comics, joined the project. Kirchner, with the help of recommendations and feedback from a paleontologist named Dr. Robert Baker, not only expanded the backstory of the property, but added to the design of the world as he drew the comic books that would be included with the initial toy line. Looking to ensure that that toy line would have the necessary support to be successful, Tycho contacted Jerry Conway, legendary comic writer and co-creator of characters like The Punisher, Miss Marvel, Firestorm, and Power Girl, and the man who killed Gwen Stacy in the Spider-Man comics, and his then-wife Carla to fully develop and put finishing touches on the story while prepping a companion cartoon. The company then found a partner for the creation of the animated series in the form of Stephen Hahn Productions, who picked up the concept to create two specials for VHS home release to accompany the toy launch. Later, though, development moved to Marvel Productions, who added the series to a part of their syndicated 90-minute programming block, The Marvel Action Universe, where it aired for a single 14-episode season from October 1st through December 31st, 1988, or maybe 13 episodes through December 24th. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Production of the Dino Riders cartoon is kind of a story in two parts, as the first two episodes exist in a sort of vacuum separate from the remaining eleven. This is because the first two episodes of the series were produced as standalones intended for VHS release. Stephen Hahn Productions was the studio Tycho initially worked with, and the studio's namesake, director of the animated feature film Star Chaser, The Legend of Orin, directed those episodes himself. The animation work for these episodes was outsourced to the South Korean studio Han Ho Hyung Up Company Limited, with the soundtrack being composed by Udi Harpaz. However, starting with episode 3, Marvel Productions took over the series, and directing duties were taken over by veteran animation director Ray Lee. Prior to working on Dino Riders, Lee had served as the supervising director on 30 episodes each of G.I. Joe and the Transformers, as well as 55 episodes of Defenders of the Earth and the entire 13-episode run of the Inhumanoids. Another South Korean studio was chosen to take over the animation work as well, with the contract going to Acom Productions Limited. The music for the series was composed by prolific cartoon sound machines Shuki Levy and Haim Saban. Mostly. Maybe. I'd like to note here that IMDb credits Levy and Saban with 11 episodes, specifically episodes 3 through 13, but their names appear as music by in the actual credits of the first episode, with no mention of my previously identified Harpaz to be found, even though IMDb lists him as the composer for episodes 1 and 2. Also, anecdotally, you don't really hear any changes in the music between those first couple of episodes and the latter ones. 
Production for the series is honestly a little muddy in a couple areas like this, especially when you consider that discrepancy I mentioned earlier between there being 13 and 14 episodes. Most credits on IMDb have a clear line of delineation between episodes 1 and 2, and then episodes 3 through 13. There's a page for the 14th episode that doesn't list any crew though, referring to it by the title Ice Age Adventure, but there's also a separate page for a video release called Dino Riders in the Ice Age. As best I can tell though, these two things are the same, and both refer to what was intended to be the second series premiere. It's even possible to find the episode, or video, or whatever it was here on YouTube, and in the credits it states that Stephen Hahn was the director once again, with his studio, and a third, completely different animation studio handling production. It also lists an air date for the 14th episode on IMDb of December 31st, 1988, which is also how it's listed on TV.com and the Internet Archive, although Wikipedia lists episode 14 with both the episode title and the video titles in both the same entry, and only notes a VHS release. So which is it? I honestly have no idea, so I guess it boils down to which source you trust. Personally, if it was a season 2 pilot, the timing doesn't make sense to me, so I'd be more inclined to believe it was only a video release, but if one of you knows for sure, please speak up in the comments. Anyway, before we move on, let's take a quick look at the voice cast, who were directed by the man who served as voice director for so many of the 80's best shows, Wally Burr. Well, at least they were for 11 episodes. Again, I'm not really clear on those last few because, well, IMDB. Anyway, Wally Burr was the guy in charge for the entire run of G.I. Joe, Transformers, Inspector Gadget, Gem, Visionaries, and Humanoids. Just so many awesome series. Here on Dino Riders, he led a cast that consisted of notable animation alum that we've talked about in past videos, like Rob Paulson, Frank Welker, Peter Cullen, Charlie Adler, and Dan Gilvezan. There were also some other familiar voices whose names haven't come up in any of my series yet, like Noel North, who played Slouchy Smurfling in The Smurfs, Cubby in The Gummy Bears, and Rowane in The Legend of Prince Valiant. Christopher Collins, best known to us all as the voice of both Starscream and Cobra Commander, and Cam Clark, the voice of TMNT's Leonardo and Robotech's Max Sterling. And lastly, the series also features a young Stephen Dorff in the role of Lad, years before his career really took off, and even before he started spelling his name with a PH if you believe how he appears in the credits. Taking a look at what kind of reach the series had, we don't really find much. There was a three-issue comic series from Marvel written by the co-founder of Penthouse Comics, George Caragone, with art by Kelly Jones, best known for Neil Gaiman's Sandman, which were much darker and more mature than the cartoon. Other than that, though, the show had the normal 80s animation merchandise, like lunchboxes and such, but never got the movie or video game treatment. It does also look to have gotten at least some home video releases in other countries like Australia, Finland, Germany, and a handful more, and was potentially even aired in Germany and the Netherlands, as there are release dates for both on IMDb, but I'm not able to verify that. Otherwise, the property was limited to just three series of the toy line and the companion Ice Age series. Unfortunately, the series also doesn't have much of a legacy to speak of. There had been talk of making a modern live-action movie, with current owner of the property Mattel even being in discussions with Solipsist Film back in 2015, though it's been quiet on that front since 2018. It's not completely forgotten though, with references appearing everywhere from South Park to Toy Story, and even a song in the series Robot Chicken performed by former Skid Row frontman and outspoken pop culture enthusiast Sebastian Bach. There was also a modern 2021 toy release, though instead of action figures and play sets in the classic 1988 style, it consisted of cast plastic, non-posable figures. There's been no news or momentum from the property since. So there's a quick deep dive into the world of Dino Riders. I do mean quick, too, as I saw while working on this today that another YouTube channel uploaded an hour and 20 minute long look at the series yesterday. That's like an actual full-on documentary, and that's really just not what I'm trying to go for. But I guess that's what I get for not having done this last week when I was supposed to. Anyway, check back later this week for the first Tokusatsu in America video, and you can expect the 1997 video, either in its entirety or part one, this weekend. Make sure to share your thoughts and memories about Dino Riders below, and feel free to throw out ideas for next week's Deep Dive 2. Thanks for watching everyone. Stay tuned and stay tuned, as in cartoons. Later.